Welcome back to 60 Miles from Anywhere. Today I'm going to talk about the editing process and even read two sections of something I've been working on. A first draft and my latest draft. You can see how the story is crafted into something better, I hope. I would like to think it gets better with every pass anyway, but it's all a process and this is a first versus a third draft. By the end of it, the whole book will probably have six or seven drafts. It's time consuming and tedious, but I think you'll see it's worth it. If you like this episode, please check out my website, 60milesfromanywhere.com. There you will find more stories on my blog as well as insights about creative writing. My fiction is available on Amazon.com, and you can find the link on my website, 60milesfromanywhere.com. The book is called Song of the Cinder, and it's available in both trade paperback and ebook for Kindle. I wrote it in 2014, and um, so far a lot of people like it. It makes a great gift for that lover of fantasy, alternate history, or horror in your life. Your donation to support this podcast and my website are always appreciated with my Buy Me a Coffee link. Be sure you leave a rating or a comment on the platform you're subscribed to. Ratings and comments help improve my rankings on platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and many others. I'm also an affiliate with Origin USA, a company that makes boots, jeans, and martial arts gear, and all sorts of other things that are 100% American-made. Click the link on my website and use code HARRIS10 for 10% off your next purchase. I've been wearing mine for nearly two years, and I never leave home without them. I put them through some things that would chew up other boots, from climbing up the side of mountains to walking several miles a day in European cities. They work great on the trail, and if you polish them up, you can wear them to a nice, fancy restaurant for dinner. All content is written, recorded, and produced by me, Clinton A. Harris. If you're interested in working with me for podcasting, writing, or other projects, please contact me via the links on my website, 60milesfromanywhere.com. Let's begin. Lately, I've been talking a lot about the writing process. There are a few reasons for this. First of which, and probably the biggest reason, is the weather sucks right now, and I'm not going to be able to go anywhere else that I usually do. In this part of the world, winter is a very real thing. In Game of Thrones, I don't think any statement resonated more with me than winter is coming. When I was growing up, we faced the very real possibility of being snowed in for days. The roads were treacherous, and when our first snowstorm usually hit on Halloween, it could snow all the way until early June. We were very well aware of winter. Now I use winter as a good reason to stay inside and work. Lately, my work has been a lot of time in the book, specifically editing. So today I wanted to talk some about my process in editing and what keeps me sane as I'm stuck inside during the winter months while I work. Editing is probably as important as writing. It separates good writing from awful writing. I've mentioned this before. There is no one right way to do any of it either. If you asked 100 writers what their process was, you would probably get 105 different methods. I also know what my process is, and it varies per project. No two short stories or books have been written the same. It's a constantly evolving process. If somebody has the consistency to write the same way for everything that they do, then my hat is off to them. It's just not how I operate. My first published book was Song of the Cinder. It began as a short story I was writing about World War I airplanes that had spirits of war horses trapped inside of them. The world building formed almost fractile-like, spreading out from that concept. I wrote a 14,000-word novelette by the end of it, centering around a main character, and everything just snowballed from there. I had to make a decision about the story. I submitted it to a few magazines and was told the usual. We have a limited number of pages to fill with stories, and if we publish your 14,000 words, that means two other writers, who are probably well-known, can't get into the magazine. The big spots were usually reserved for big-name writers, and more often than not, reprints that they had written. There was just no room at the end for my story, I guess. I decided my chances of being published in a magazine were almost zero with a project of this size, so I let my imagination fly. I combined a few trunk stories and some other ideas I was working on, and I fleshed it out to about 90,000 words. 
The story took on an immortal samurai, a bomb that can level a city, interstitial worlds, elder gods, and skinwalkers. And by the end of it, it was just so much fun to write. The editing process of that was similar to this book, though, and I'll get into that later. With Song of the Cinder, I started off with a core idea for the book, and pass after pass, I really made it solid. The second half of the book was a little looser, but by then the world building had been established. The characters had their origin stories and their beginnings mapped out, and they would lead out to different plot lines as needed. Um, As the book progressed, I was less concerned about perfection and more about just moving the story along. Each pass would hit the first act of the book, and I would continue writing and adding to later chapters, sometimes fitting in a new chapter towards the beginning. The first part of the book took the most number of passes of edits, and by the time I got to the end of the book, the later chapters were actually better written because I had some idea of my own voice and what I wanted to do with the story. In essence, the beginning of the book was probably around uh, 10 or 11 passes in drafts. The end chapters might have gotten four. By that point, I could turn the page and know exactly where something happened in the story, almost down to the word. Having a very good memory helps with this, as long as you allow your brain to breathe with creating new content and not just being locked into editing. That's how it is for me anyway. Editing for me is the business of second-guessing yourself. You can rearrange words in an infinite number of times and have an infinite number of possibilities left over. Sometimes you just have to decide if they sound right. Reading aloud helps immensely. I know some writers who edit as they write, giving themselves a final pass at the end for typos and grammar. My final passes are usually grammar and consistency with names, since I've been known to change names several times throughout the process of writing a book. Also, I'm a hybrid of a plotter and a pantser. Now, if you're unfamiliar with these terms, a plotter is somebody who starts off with an outline or fool's cap to figure out how the story is going to be told from beginning to end. The reason I don't plot this way is I find the process too rigid. Like life, I like to present my characters with a number of challenges and try to get them through them. Sometimes something cool happens based on the possibilities, and they do something I would have never expected. And if I'd plotted it out, I never would have seen it happen. I do have a loose idea of what has happened and what needs to happen. I have a goal to get to, a resolution to the problem, and sometimes I'll even have the end of the story already written before I have most of the rest of the story done. Um, Sometimes I'll take what I know has happened in the story, and I'll work out a plot to make sure I'm sticking to that kind of structure. I'll also write down what my themes are, crucial elements that have to be in the story, and the character arc for each of the mains. I'll also sketch out an emotional blueprint of what I want the reader to experience. These are the things like heartbreak, um, sadness, joy, um, victory, that kind of thing, and where I need to put those kind of things. That's just kind of how I map it out loosely. In a weird way, I'm a plotter and a pantser simultaneously. I go in knowing that my outline always changes and I'm not married to it. I also hope to let the story change and evolve as I pick up new ideas and experiences outside of the book, and then I can chuck them into the mix. It's a lot like making a stew. You know the basics. You sear the beef, you add the mirepoix, the broth, and thyme. Not the spice, but actual thyme. But the other ingredients are all about what you feel like doing. Potatoes, mushrooms, spices, wine, how long you want it to cook. Basically, the fundamentals of cooking tell you it's going to be a stew, and whatever you want to add to it will tell you what kind of stew it's going to be. In my recent project, I've been looking at some of the elements of the story and how I need to work on edits. The question has been asked before, and I guess the most basic way to explain it is like a stew. All stews are soups, but not all soups are stews. Grammar and spelling are elements of editing, but editing is so much more. Editing allows you to massage the text into whatever you want it to become. It's how you choose your words and sentences and tone to affect the way a reader responds to the story. It can be very blatant and also very subtle. There are all sorts of tricks to use that you probably remember from high school composition class. 
alliteration, simile, metaphor, short sentences, and action words to emphasize action and urgency, evocative imagery, which can be downright purple to draw out a feeling. And the crazy thing about knowing all of your fundamentals, like grammar and spelling, is when you use them, you're not even conscious of them when you write. Some of the most important rules should be second nature. And these things are like subject and verb agreement. If you have plural subjects, you need to use the right verbs for them. Don't fuck up your pronouns either. And these days, you don't have to worry about descriptive words and dialogue. It's not the Tom Swifty contest from Boy's Life magazine. A simple he said, she said is going to work fine. One of the things this project has made me look at is how personal details might alienate the reader rather than draw them in. Going too far into detail and describing something takes the reader out of the story. I'm also working on losing empty expressions and cliches. If the story starts to sound sing-songy, I've got no better way of explaining what I mean by that. It just hits the ear wrong when you read it. Then it gets cut. Sparse, effective prose versus purple prose is also important. I love to describe weather and setting, but sometimes, almost all the time, less is more. So today, I'm going to read the first draft version of a scene versus a third draft. Hopefully you can see how much difference editing makes for each. So this is a first draft section, and I'm going to start in the same place for both of these. It doesn't matter, Nick thought. What Ashley did and what she thought no longer mattered to him. She had treated him as though he were beneath her for years, ashamed to even introduce him to others, unable to even refer to him as her boyfriend when she admitted to having so many in the years before she was married. She had given him crumbs, and for the last four months they were together, he had only seen her for a few days. It would be a few months later that he discovered that while he was half world away, she was getting engaged to another man. In the days that followed, Nick had adjusted to London. A snowstorm hit Colorado, extending his trip by another day. He ate noodles and sushi at a restaurant in Soho and spent the last days on foot, pointing himself in the direction and getting lost again, just to see what he could discover. As he walked in Hyde Park near Kensington Palace, Nick saw a group of young people, French high school students by the look of them. The boys attempted to hang on trees while the young women watched them from the grass. A pair of them sat on the grass together. A young, dark-haired man... Sorry. A dark-haired young man with a girl laying across his lap. She was braiding a few pieces of grass as he stroked her hair. He couldn't understand much of anything they were saying, but he knew that it was all the same. Twenty years ago, or was it just yesterday, he sat with a young woman in much the same way, lounging on each other, young and in love, Suzanne braiding the stems of clovers together and handing them to Nick when she was done, their friends fooling around and showing off. The only thing he missed on the whole trip was that companionship. He had it all those years ago. He and Suzanne used to talk about the places they would go together, back when his legs didn't hurt, back when he had a little bit of money, but he was saving up for what he didn't know anymore. Lawyers, credit card bills, child support for kids he never got to see anymore. It was too late to go back and drag Suzanne out of the past to be with him now. He wondered about the couple on the grass in front of him. He wondered if in ten years they would still be together. Would they even remember this moment? He promised himself that the next time he came back to London, he wouldn't be alone. He wanted to share it with someone special, to build memories with someone again. He walked back towards his flat and was stopped by a group of ladies on the path in Hyde Park. They were holding a map and looking in all directions. They told him they were from Austria and trying to find South Kensington. Nick asked them if they were taking the tube or walking and wound up telling them directions for both. They thanked him and went on their way. When the plane landed back home, he had a five-pound note and a handful of change left over. This is that same section with a later draft. It begins with, I think if you actually wanted to go anywhere, she told him once, you would have done it already. 
I need to be with someone who will go places with me. It doesn't matter, Nick thought. What Ashley did and what she thought of him no longer mattered. She had treated him as an inferior for years, ashamed to even introduce him to her friends. She was never his. She had given him crumbs, and for the last months they were together, he had only seen her a few times. Months later, he discovered that while he was sitting in the bathtub in London, she was getting engaged to another man. Nick had adjusted to London. He ate noodles and sushi at a restaurant in Soho and spent the last day on foot, pointing himself in a direction and getting lost, just to see what he could discover. As he walked in his favorite spot in Hyde Park, Nick saw a group of young people, French high school students from the looks of them. The boys attempted to hang on trees while the young women watched them from the grass. A dark-haired young man sat on the grass with a young lady laying across his lap. She was braiding a few pieces of grass as he stroked her hair. He couldn't understand much of anything they were saying, but he knew what it was all the same. Twenty-five years ago, or was it just yesterday? He had sat with a young woman in much the same way, lounging on each other, young and in love. Suzanne braided clover stems together for Nick as their friends fooled around, showing off. He missed that kind of companionship. He had it all those years ago. His pillow talk with Suzanne used to be about all the places they would go together. Back then, his legs didn't hurt. He had a little bit of money he was saving up. Now anything he had went to lawyers, credit card bills, and child support for kids he never got to see. It was too late to go back and drag Suzanne out of the past to be here with him now. He wondered about the couple on the grass. In ten years, would they be together? Would they even remember this moment? He promised himself that the next time he came to London, he wouldn't be alone. He wanted to share it with someone special, to build memories with someone again. On the way back to his flat, he was stopped by a group of ladies. They were holding up a map and looking in all directions. "'Excuse us, sir,' one of them said. The others looked at her with apprehension. "'Yes? We are from Austria, and this is our first day here. Do you know the way to South Kensington? Are you taking the underground or walking?' Which way is best? The tube will be quickest. He wound up telling them directions for both. They thanked him and went on their way. In ten days, he had gone from being as lost as they were to giving directions. This is what I want to do, he thought. I want to see the world and talk about it with fresh eyes and tired legs. I want to be a travel writer. When the plane landed back home, he had a five-pound note and a pocket full of change left over. So you might have noticed at the end of that section, um, the third draft, I changed a lot of the description that was just basic declarative sentences into an actual conversation. There's a lot of dialogue in there. Um, There's a lot of other different little tweaks, and you're welcome to go back and listen to it over and over again if you need to. But really, a lot of what dictated what I decided to change had to deal with how it sounded when I read it. Over and I actually read my stories out loud sometimes. I do that with my podcasts too. I will actually script out something and then I'll read it. And if it doesn't sound right, or if I inadvertently put in a tongue twister, I usually change that because who wants to hear me go um uh and stutter all over everything? Nobody. Nobody wants to hear that. The same is true for when you write fiction or any kind of prose. Um, it's a little bit different when you read it. And in your head, it comes off different. Some people actually don't even have a monologue when they read. It's crazy. When I read something, it's like I hear my own voice in my head as I'm reading. And some people don't have that. But for me, it's important to actually get the words right and get a cadence down and that flow. And usually, it's just kind of a feel. If you read through it, and it flows well, then you know. So this third draft for me, it flowed better than the first draft, but I still see that it needs a lot of work, and it still has a lot of little things that I kind of cringe at when I read, but that's what more drafts are for. So editing is a lot more than grammar and spelling. It's structure. It's how to put words together in different ways to get a different response out of the reader. So 
I hope this has been helpful for you. It was kind of fun to share a project that I'm working on right now. And hopefully you like what you read or what you heard. And um, (laughs) that's about all I've got for tonight. So if you like what you hear, please shoot me a comment. You can email me. You can comment on the website. And uh, you can also post comments on Spotify, Audible, wherever you're getting these podcasts from. I'd like to hear your response. And that's about it for tonight. So bye for now.